Good morning. It's good to be together again after a week's respite. We'll begin, as we have the past several weeks, with the same prayer that Francis prayed in front of the crucifix, the San Damiano crucifix. Won't you join me? Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, sense and knowledge, Lord, that I may carry out your holy and true command. Amen. And that was the longing of Francis' heart to always follow the Lord's holy and true command. Last week we talked about St. Clair, or two weeks ago. And let me just move over into our next part of this talk, but by transitioning with some words of St. Clair that she wrote in a letter to another one of her poor Clair sisters who were in a different monastery. He was in a different monastery, Agnes of Prague. Claire wrote, what you hold, may you always hold. What you do, may you always do and never abandon. But with swift pace and light step and feet unstumbling, so that even your steps stir up no dust, go forward securely, joyfully, and swiftly on the path of prudent happiness. I love those words, and I use them in my homily to the parish community here who were gathered on the Feast of St. Clair. But she's writing those words to a contemplative. Go forward, joyfully, swiftly, with feet on stumbling, with swift pace, and light step, and you're just going to be staying in their monastery, but it's movement of the heart. But those words also describe how we friars and how Francis went and how he would want his brothers to go as well. While the Clares were nuns, we talked about this, who stayed for the most part in and around monasteries, Francis and his brothers traveled and preached. Even when Francis had only four brothers, they went out two by two, exhorting the people to repent and do penance and urging peace and reconciliation at a time when there were civil wars between feuding towns and cities. Bernard and Giles journeyed to Santiago de Compostela. Tom Spire points out that that's a round trip, now get this, of at least 2,500 miles. And they weren't using transportation, perhaps riding horses, I'm not sure. They weren't allowed to ride horses, maybe donkeys. But they'd always come back to the Port Sionkala, that little chapel, which was the womb of the order. And then with Francis as leader and other brothers coming in from other places, celebrated a chapter. It's a technical term. We still use it today. It's a meeting that has a focus and makes decisions. And during these times together, there were times to share the adventures that they had had and to hear from Father Francis. And of course, to enjoy each other's company. It's still that way today, very really. When we come together, we friars love to tell stories, 
share our life? Well, other young men saw their joy and their passion and wanted to join them. Francis gave his earliest brothers permission to welcome new members. There weren't screening rules back then like we have today. How did the brothers support themselves? Francis wanted them to do manual labor as their primary means of support. They were to earn a living. They begged as a last resort. They were to stay wherever people would welcome them. But never long, lest it seemed like they had a right to be someplace or enjoy ownership. Or they'd stay in woods if they didn't have a home. Maybe a religious house if somebody would invite them. Or houses of lepers, even in caves. In his testament, Francis wrote that they often stayed in abandoned churches. And while they're cleaning or repairing them. In whatever they were doing, manual labor, service of the poor, actual preaching, again, people saw their joy. Story is told of Francis walking with the brother through the streets of the town. We're going to go preaching, brother. So they walked through the town and didn't say anything except hello and greeting. And the brother said, Father Francis, I thought we were going to be preaching. Francis said, we did. You preach always the gospel. If necessary, use words. It's your life that preaches. It's the joy that people sees in you. It's a lesson for us all to reflect upon. Not necessarily just vowed religious, not just Franciscans. Francis would travel too with a companion during those early years. This was a time when Francis' great love for creatures and creation became apparent. There are lots of stories written of his relationship with animals. Historian Brother Bill Short says these accounts demonstrate Francis' sensitivity to the dignity of creatures, birds, lambs, hares, even worms, yes. Some stories, he says, are legends, but they teach a powerful moral lesson. For example, the story of the singing cicadas, or the larks at Francis' death. In just a couple years in our journey through Francis' biography, we'll hear the story of Francis and the renowned wolf of Gubbio. Thomas of Celano, one of Francis's earliest biographers, wrote these beautiful words, and I'll just read a portion of this. In every work of the artist, Francis praised the artist, capital A. Whatever he found in the things made, he referred to the maker. He rejoiced in all the works of the hands of the Lord. He saw th behind things pleasant to behold their life-giving reason and cause. In beautiful things, he saw beauty itself. All things were to him good. He who made us is the best, they cried out to Francis. Through his footprints impressed upon things, he followed the beloved everywhere. He made for himself from all things a ladder by which to come even to his throne. Just a few more. He embraced all things with a rapture of unheard of devotion, speaking to them of the Lord, admonishing them to praise him. He forbade the brothers to cut down the whole tree when they cut wood so that it might have hope of sprouting again. He commanded the gardener to leave the border around the garden undug 
so that in their proper times the greenness of the grass and the beauty of flowers might announce the Father, Father God, the Father of all things. He ordered that honey and the best wines be set out for the bees, not put on the brother's table, lest they perish from want in the cold of winter, the bees. Francis journeyed his companions with sense, his relationship with all creation. A story is told of Francis having a dream one night in the year 1216, when Francis was at home in the Porciuncola. Christ and his mother Mary, surrounded by angels, appeared to him. Christ asked Francis, what was your heart's desire? Francis asked, oh please, a plenary indulgence or a pardon be granted to all who visit the little chapel of St. Mary of the Angels. We saw a picture of that. Well, Christ granted Francis his desire, but only if he got permission from Pope Honorius. This was the Pope who followed Pope Innocent, who was the Pope who received Francis initially and gave him approval. Well, the Pope granted this indulgence. We're out of the dream, now this is true. Today it is observed on August the 2nd. Not just for the Porciuncola, though. It was extended at a later time to all Franciscan churches. And in 1967, to all Catholic churches. In fact, on August 2nd, 2020, Pope Francis personally went to Assisi and visited St. Mary of the Angels, the Porziuncola. Here at St. Clement, just a couple weeks ago, August the 2nd fell on a Sunday, and we told our Latino parishioners of that, and many of them took advantage of the opportunity to gain this plenary indulgence. Our Father John Paul, who speaks Spanish, celebrated the Sacrament of Reconciliation with them. But Francis wanted that pardon attached to that special place, but more in devotion to Mary, Queen of the Angels. It's now in every Catholic Church on August the 2nd. By 2016, the order was large enough that friars could be sent on missions beyond the Alps to France, Germany, Hungary, the Holy Land. This was, of course, a challenge if they didn't understand the language and couldn't learn it. How could they preach? Well, remember, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. That wasn't a stumbling block. Their joy preached, their lives preached, their example preached. If they could learn the language, fine. A story is told that in Germany, the only word that the friars visiting knew there was ja, which means yes. When asked by the people if they were heretics, ja. Well, they were beat up, <laughs> and they headed back to us easy, go back to tell Father Francis. By 1217, there were over 800 men, so things became more structured. And they were eventually grouped into provinces, and there were 12 of them already by that time. Provinces needed leaders. Francis didn't want them called superiors. Nothing that smacked of power or superiority. He preferred the title ministers and servants. That's still the title we use today, minister. Our present provincial minister signs his, your minister and servant. Their task was to find their task, the minister's task, to find places for brothers to stay and to visit 
and to watch over their spiritual lives, not to give orders. Given the large number of brothers, maybe about a thousand now by 1218, Francis was feeling inadequate. I can well imagine that. And insecure to govern these men, now spread all over. He wasn't feeling comfortable training newcomers, feeling inadequate. We'll see that Francis continued to struggle with this, as well as increasing bouts of sickness. And already then, he has a sense of the coming end. He's only 36 at the time. Some of the brothers traveled into cities where there was dissension and even street fighting. In some cases, the brothers weren't well received. Several of them went on their own to the Bishop of Ostia, Cardinal Ugolino, who was a friend of Francis and of the friars. They were seeking a letter vouching for their orthodoxy. This greatly disturbed Francis because they were seeking favors and protection. His Lord didn't seek favors and protection. He went out there among people. In his history, Father Tom Spire points out that Francis resorts as the minister of the whole group still to writing letters as a way to lead. He would exhort, but also encourage. Now, this would be a trivia question, perhaps. A most recurring theme of his in his letters. It's not poverty, which we might think it would be. But it's reverence for the Eucharist and for the church which makes the Eucharist possible. At least one Franciscan scholar believes that Francis is a forerunner of emphasis among theologians on the Eucharist and the priesthood. This is back in the early 13th century. Francis emphasized obedience to the church, for it makes Christ present in the Eucharist. Let me read to you, if I may, one of his admonitions, or part of one of his admonitions, that he's writing. Why do you not know the truth and believe in the Son of God, children? Behold, each day he humbles himself, is when he came from the royal throne into the virgin's womb. Each day he himself comes to us, appearing humbly. Each day he comes down from the bosom of the Father upon the altar in the hands of a priest. As he revealed himself to the holy apostles in true flesh, so he reveals himself to us now in sacred bread. And in this way, the Lord is always with his faithful, as he himself says, Behold, I am with you until the coming of the age. And then just a passage from his testament, his final testament. If I had as much wisdom as Solomon and found impoverished priests of this world, I would not preach in their parishes against the, their will, I desire to respect, love, and honor them and all others as my lords. I'm not encouraging persons to look upon us priests as your lords. Francis spoke this way passionately, and he meant it. I do not want to consider any sin in them, because I discern the Son of God in them, and they are my lords. And Francis knew priests sinned probably big time back in his day. The church was going through an awful lot of our people. It's not saying anything about today and the whole issue that the church is confronted, so I think, well, 
it's important that we do everything in our power to put a stop to that. But look what's behind what Francis is saying. I act in this way because in this world I see nothing corporally of the Most High Son of God except his most holy body and blood, which they receive and which they alone administer to others. And then I want to have these most holy mysteries honored and venerated above all things, and I want to reserve them in precious places. In the chapter, those annual meetings, which were, became called chapters of mats, because when if you had several thousand brothers coming to this Porzionkola chapel, there's this where they sleep. Well, they created reed huts. In 1219, there were some 3,000 friars in attendance. Learned brothers among them were trying to convince Francis to adopt another rule. It would be more structured, this vast number. The rule of Augustine, or the rule of Benedict, or Bernard. Dominic, when he went for approval of his brotherhood to the Pope, was told, you will take one of the rules already in existence. But Francis adamantly refused. He told Cardinal Hugolino, who was there, no. He says, because the Lord himself gave me the rule when I opened the book of the Gospels. Remember the passages? We went through them. We friars are reminded of them at every one of our funeral services. I have that in front of me here, what's read when the body is received. The very first rule, just passages from the Gospel. And when the Francis went to see Pope Innocent with his early brothers to St. John Lateran, the cathedral church. The Pope approved his living of the gospel. Let's wrap this up quickly. Francis wanted there to be two chapters every year when the brothers would come together, one at Pentecost, the other around the Feast of St. Michael. The fires were settled in far-flung areas. It's not be possible. So by 1217, only one was held. But even that was too hard for these thousands of men to come together. So actually, 1221 was the last year for all the friars to attend. In 1222, the provinces began to have their chapters every year, and that's the way it is now, actually every three years. The provincials met every three years at the Port Siuncula. And the provincials still today go whenever there is a chapter of the order to the Port Siuncula, from all around the world. In 1219, final thing, a decision was made that no friars would reach out to Muslims. Forgive me. A decision was made that friars would reach out to Muslims. Some volunteered. The first five, they were martyred, beheaded in Morocco in 1221. The order's first martyrs. Francis and his companions chose to go to Damietta. Military forces were preparing for war. The church was involved, staging a crusade under the motto, Deus Volt, which means God wills. And the Pope granted a plenary indulgence to all who would fight against those pagan Muslims. Deus Volt. Francis said, absolutely not. God does not will it. So what does Francis do? He goes instead to the camp of the sultan. It's an amazing story. And we'll pick that up next Friday. Have a wonderful week. And thanks again.